be really good. Well, if you would open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to begin by looking at verse 7 today. And the Lord's uh, had this on my heart for the past few weeks. And, and just I was kind of waiting for the right time. And, you know, we have different sermon series that we do to emphasize certain things that the Lord is saying. But, um, you know, how many of you believe we're always in the series of what the Holy Spirit is saying? And so sometimes we'll just have individual messages that are uh, just what the Holy Spirit has for us. And so I believe that's what this is today. And um, I'm excited about it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I mean, I'm glad LSU did not lose yesterday. I have more joy when they don't play, I think. It just brings me a lot of joy just when they don't play. Uh, <laughs> praise God. And, and the Saints are playing tomorrow night. And uh, to ensure that they have the proper amount of prayer, um, me and my wife are going to the game. And uh, they'll, they'll, yeah. And the Lord bless us with some tickets. And, and uh, so we're going to the game. So they will have a prayer section. If there was any team that the Lord loves, you know it has to be the Saints, right? God, I mean, think about the name, the Saints, right? I mean, the Pelicans, ah, they're, that's a bird. Uh, they're playing who? The Ravens. It's a black bird, all right? I mean, it's like, yeah, but we're playing, we're the, the Saints. We are God's people, y'all. God's chosen people, God's chosen football team, and therefore... Amen. We're going to have a good time. All right, y'all got the word. At least we can agree on the word for sure. Y'all got the word tonight, today, excuse me, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, um, begs to reason that if God has not given us a spirit of fear, then uh, where would a spirit of fear come from? Where would the source of that fear be? Now, I'm not talking about um, having a holy fear of God or for God. We should have uh, a fear of the Lord. Proverbs talks about that, that. That's the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. It's the fear of God. And so that means having a, an awe, a reverence, a respect, a holy respect of God. We should have that. But this kind of fear that he's talking about isn't an awe, reverence, or respect of God. It's talking about living in fear, which is living in a state of, of, of torment, of anxiety, of torture, of uh, a place where, always, uh, where you're always worried, always concerned, always, your heart's always gripped by uh, uh, what the future may hold or may not hold, fear of the past, fear of what people are going to do or not going to do. Um, he says he's not given us a spirit of fear. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. So if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, you've received his grace, his love, his goodness, his joy, his peace that is present here today, then fear should not grip you. Anybody in here made Jesus the Lord of your life? Jesus is the Lord of your life. You've received him. You believe in him for salvation, right? So that means everyone who raised your hand, you should not living, you should not be living in fear. You should be living in faith. You should be living in faith. Praise God. But yet so many people do. Even, so, even many Christians live in a place where they're still afraid of things, have fear of things, afraid to to love again, afraid to try again. Uh, many people are afraid to fail. Uh, many are afraid to succeed. Many are, are afraid that if they are being successful, that at some point the bottom's gonna drop out. It's going too good for them. Some people are afraid of sickness, afraid of uh, wellness. If I'm, if I'm doing this healthy and I'm doing this well, I'm bound to get sick next week. Um, afraid of lack, afraid of... Uh, what, what they're not going to have that they're going to need in the future. Um, and in this time and this season and even uh, this year that we're living in, there's a lot of reasons to potentially have fear as far as the things that we see, read about, hear about. Um, as far as ISIS is concerned, Ebola, financial crisis, there's a lot of reasons to potentially have a lot of fear of what the future may hold, either for us individually or uh, as, a, as a country, or even as Christians, there's a lot of reasons to be, to be filled with fear. I, I, read, uh, I read this on, online actually this morning, so I had it printed out and wanted to read it to you. Um, people in the year 2000, this is what they said, uh, Y2K is going to kill us all. 
In 2001, anthrax is going to kill us all. In 2002, West Nile virus is going to kill us all. In 2003, weapons of mass destruction are going to kill us all. 2004, SARS is going to kill us all. 2005, bird flu is going to kill us all. 2006, E. coli is going to kill us all. 2007, vaccines are going to kill us all. 2008, the bad economy is going to kill us all. 2009, swine flu is going to kill us all. 2010, uh, BP oil is going to kill us all. 2011, Obamacare is going to kill us all. 2012, the end of the world is going to kill us all. 2013, North Korea is going to kill us all. In 2014, Ebola is going to kill us. How many of you know uh, is going to kill us all? How many of you know that, there, that in every season and every year of life, there's potential to have a lot of fear uh, concerning what holds our future? Amen. You know, we're not to be frozen by fear. You know, if you live according to what you're afraid of, then you'll never move forward into what God has for your future. The plan that God has for your life is a plan that will require faith of you. That means it's going to require you living by faith, taking steps of faith. And when you take steps of faith, it may seem at times that you're taking steps into things that are unknown per se into what you can see and understand. But if we're living by faith, that means we're living in faith in one who is greater than us who has a plan and a purpose for us, who has a destiny for us. God hasn't called you to live by fear. He's called you to live in faith. You don't have to be afraid of the bird flu. You don't have to be afraid of the economy going down. In fact, you don't have to be afraid of any of the things that I just listed, even though there's some real issues there. We can still have faith in the creator of the universe that if he's big enough to create this universe, amen, and big enough to put us here, he has a plan for us until he comes back to us again. Praise God. I don't have to live life worried and anxious every single, you don't have to get up every day and read the paper or watch the news and then just go filled with fear about all the bad things that are going on. You can get up in the morning and read the good news, the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done and the gospel that it is to us and be filled with faith as you go and as you walk out of that door that even though Ebola is a real thing, even though ISIS is a real thing, even though financial crisis is a real thing, There is a God that I have put my trust in who is bigger than any disease, bigger than any attack of the enemy, bigger than ISIS, hallelujah, bigger than any attack of the enemy. Hallelujah. We have his word on it, praise God. If we can hold fast to him and hold fast to his word, we can keep standing. We can keep standing. We can keep standing. We can stand in faith. We can stand in faith. God's called you to live by faith. He's called you to live in faith. Amen. Amen. I like something I I, uh, heard and read. One minister say her name was Christine Kane. She said, at the threshold of every major transition in life, the enemy will send a spirit of fear to try and stop you from taking the next step of faith. At the threshold of every major transition in life, the enemy will send a spirit of fear to try and stop you from taking the next step of faith. What does he want you to do? He wants you to shrink back from taking the step that God has called you to take. The enemy tries to get you to live in fear so you won't step into your God-given destiny, your God-given purpose. The enemy wants you to shrink back and say, no, you can't do that. You can't take that step of faith. I'm here to tell you that if God is on my side and I'm walking with him and he's walking with me, then what do we have to lose? Who do we have to fear if the greater one is dwelling on the inside of us? He's given us a spirit of power. Come on. He's given us a spirit of love and soundness of mind. That means we can do what God has called called us to do, not in timidity, but in faith, and we can have our good wits about us as we do it. I'm not going to lose my mind doing what God has called me to do. I'm going to do it in love, and I'm going to do it in the power of God and in the power of his Holy Spirit. You know, the enemy, what he'll try to do is he'll try to keep you from taking that next step in faith because he wants you looking back at some area or some way that you missed it. I think, well, I missed it here, so I I shouldn't try that again. Just a few weeks ago, I picked up a magazine, uh, People Magazine. It was uh, 
filled with survival stories. I don't know about you, but I like to read the stories of how people survived crazy things that happened in their life. I read one of this one particular lady who she was jumping out of an airplane and she, she'd done it hundreds of times. She jumped out of the airplane, she pulled for her chute to come out and it didn't come out. She pulled the emergency one, it didn't come out. And she landed, I don't know how many stories and how many hundreds of feet, but she fell flat on the ground, flat on the ground and she landed in all places in an ant pile. They said when they found her that she had been bitten 200 times by ants, but yet the 200 bites by the ants are what charged her heart to keep her still living. <laughs> the one thing that she fell in that could have been the worst thing is what kept her alive, isn't that amazing? She lived to tell the story. There's another story of a woman by the name of uh, Bethany Hamilton. You may have heard of her before. Uh, she has a movie called Soul Survivor, Soul Surfer, right? Soul Surfer. Um, great movie. My, my little girl, Avery, loves, loves that movie. And it's all about this little girl who was 13 years old living on the island of Kauai in Hawaii. And she's on that island. She's a surfer. She's been surfing many, many years since she's a little kid. And uh, she was out surfing some deep waters. And she had her arm hanging over the surfboard. And they say a shark, probably about 18 feet long, came and just bit her arm off right there bit her arm off right there. The amazing thing is this, though, that within three months, she was already back out on a custom surfboard so she could get back out and surfing again. Not only that, she became a professional surfer, a professional surfer, and now is a living testimony of the goodness, the grace, and the blessing of God. She won tournaments, was a professional. Now she's on Amazing Race. She's married, blessed, blessed woman of God. But I don't know about you, but if a shark would have bit my arm off, I'm not sure if I would have been back in the water. <laughs> Some of you watch Jaws one time and you're like, yeah, no more baths for me. We're going to be taking showers from now on, praise the Lord. No more bathtubs, no more swimming pools, nothing like that. In fact, I was, I was going through the channels just the other day and the, the Jaws movie was on from way back when. And Jude saw it and he goes, oh, I want to watch Jaws. I'm like, no, no, you ain't watching Jaws, man. No, no, I want you to enjoy your bathtubs, brother. Some reason you think that shark can come through the drain in the bathtub. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. But the enemy would like to keep you in a place of frozenness by your fear, where you don't move because of maybe an experience that you had or a bad, bad experience that happened. Something happened in your past, and, and because of that one thing that happened, you had lack or you had something go on, someone hurt you, something happened, and you go, well, I, I can't move forward because I'm constantly thinking about this area of my life, and that's really where the enemy comes in, and he tries to surround you with fear. It's interesting that the enemy, if he can get fear into you in one area of your life, he'll try to multiply that into other areas of your life. That means if he can keep you in a place of fear in one way, he'll try to keep you surrounded by fear in every way so that you never live by faith. Yes, you may go to heaven one day, but you'll never fulfill God's, God's divine destiny and plan that he has for you. You must learn to face your fears in faith. Face your fears in faith. Face your fears in faith. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but he's given you a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. You have what it takes to overcome any fear that the enemy tries to bring into your life. In fact, you shouldn't allow any fear in your life. You shouldn't allow it. I remember hearing the story of a minister by the name of uh, Kenneth Copeland, how he said he used to have a, a great fear of heights, a great fear of heights. And uh, of all things now, besides being a minister, he's also a pilot, so that's kind of ironic, but um, he had a great fear of heights. I mean, and, and at, at some point, one time, he said, you know what, I've had enough of this. I'm not going to be afraid of heights any longer. That means, you know, when you go up the stairs, you go, you know, you go climb some stairs, you go up an elevator or whatever it is, I, boy, I get a little bit nervous. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He said, I'm going to overcome this fear. So what did he do? He said, I went and found the biggest building I could find with the biggest elevator I could find. And he said, I went and got in that elevator where I could see down, where I could look out the elevator. It had like glass, you know, and I could see. He said, and I went and I got in that elevator and I went to the very top floor. Then I went all the way down to the bottom. Then I hit the button, went very, back to the very top floor again. Then I hit the button, button and I went all the way back down to the bottom. Then I hit the button to go to the top floor again. 
Then I hit the button to go all the way back. He said, I'm just overcoming this fear. And the whole time I'm going up and I'm going down, I'm saying, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. Hit that button, go to the top. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. Going all the way down and I'm gonna look out the window. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm gonna go back to the very top of this thing. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. I refuse to be frozen by fear. I'm not going to live the rest of my life always afraid. Listen, if you don't know how to swim, take some lessons. Instead of every time you walk around a pool, you walk 30 feet away. No, 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 no. You don't have to live afraid. My mama never did learn how to swim. Never did learn how to swim. She got in the pool all the time, but she never did learn how to swim. That means when we went swimming with her, if we were drowning, well... About to meet your maker, praise Jesus. And she does, don't go in that deep end. You stay with me in the shallow end. You don't have to live your life in fear of the bathtub. You don't have to live your life in fear of heights. You don't have to let the devil win in any area of your life. Face your fears. Get back on the surfboard. Come on, get right back out there and say, you know what? I'm not going to lack allow one bad thing that happened in my life to keep me from moving forward. Maybe somebody hurt you. Maybe the person that you married hurt you, but you can feel free to be in faith and to love again. Love again. You don't have to live in fear that I'm going to be alone the rest of my life. You may be single today, but you don't have to live in fear. Can't tell you how many times I've seen people marry people that may not have been the best person for them because they were afraid of being alone. You know what's worse than being alone? Being married to the wrong person. So that's what's worse. <laughs> you don't have to live in fear of being alone. You can rest assured that the, that the creator we're talking about this morning has the right person at the right time, at the right place, just for you. I'm not in fear. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in fear. We can live in faith. We can live in faith. Therefore, I will not allow the enemy one area of my life where I live in fear. Amen. I looked up these, these list of phobias, and I just kind of highlighted a few of them because it's interesting what people can be afraid of. You may have seen or heard some of these before, um, and I have over the years, but I, I ran into a few new ones I thought you might enjoy are you ready? And forgive me for not knowing how to pronounce all these just right. Just know that at the end of all of them is phobia. <laughs> the rest, just pray for me. One is a Venus trophobia. This is the fear of beautiful women. I do not have that one. I'm, I'm married a beautiful woman, praise God. Anthropophobia is, is the fear of people. A phenof, a, a Aphiophobia is uh, to be afraid when touched. Be afraid when touched. Another one, autodesomophobia, is uh, the fear of vile odor. <laughs> yeah. All teenage boys need to recognize that one. I'll never forget the first, first time I realized that there was a bad smell uh, coming out of my armpit. Any guys remember that time? You're like, what? What the heck is going on, man? This ain't good. My dad looked at me and goes, Aaron, it's time to start wearing some deodorant, man. Uh, this is a modern one. Nomophobia, uh, the fear of losing cell phone contact. Don't lie. Some of y'all, when you leave one room and your phone's not with you, what do you do? You're like, straight to the phone, afraid of losing cell phone. Uh, gammophobia, this is, says a, a valid fear of getting married. Mm. This is a good one for Thanksgiving. Uh, Sin Genesis phobia. And this is the, the fear of all relatives. <laughs> this is where Thanksgiving and Christmas are torture for you. Uh, ecclesiophobia. And uh, this is the fear of church or going to church. I know a few people like that. They're not here today, are they? Uh, spectrophobia, these are those who are afraid, too afraid to look at their own reflection in a mirror. <laughs> oh, man. Asymmetrophobia, this is uh, if you're afraid of mismatched socks. Some of y'all do not have this, we know. We know because they, they're mismatched all the time. Uh, macrophobia, the fear of long waits. 
Here's, here's one I know, I've known a few over the years. Uh, ergophobia, uh, the fear of work. <laughs> yeah, before you call in to say, uh, yeah, boss, I've had, I got ergophobia. Um, <laughs> He's going to say, you're fired too. Do that one more time. <laughs> um, here's another one. Uh, ephibiophobia, something like that, says, uh, refers to the fear of teenagers. Any parents know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Pedophobia, the fear of children. <laughs> you wouldn't think people would be afraid of children, but I know some people afraid of children. Alado- Let me just say this. If you're afraid of a dog, you don't have to be. That's not on my list. I said, you don't have to be. You don't have, I'm not saying you have to own dogs. I'm just saying you don't have to be afraid of dogs. I said, you don't have to be afraid of dogs. I can remember when I was uh, in high school, I'd go jogging down the road out where my parents lived in, in uh, Woodworth and be jogging down Cooley Crossing. And there's always, people just drop stray dogs all, out there, used to, all the time. So you just have dogs that don't belong to anybody just running down the road. I mean, now we have neighbors who, when they go, go for a little walk or, or down the road, they carry a golf club with them. Not because they're playing golf. <laughs> just letting the dogs know. And so I, I can remember jogging down that road and a dog w- uh, would, would start chasing me. Boy, in my heart. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> My heart just like jumping out of my chest. I feel like that dog, what's, what's going to happen really? Is the dog's going to eat me? He's not going to eat me. I'm going to live through this process. But in my heart, I'm like, man, my heart's beating. I've never run that fast in my life. I'm really running fast past that house. Every time I'd come up on that house, you'd get nervous about it. and just start running, 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 running. So one time I'm running, I'm running past that house. And that dog just, you know, he's just, he's just guarding his house or that, that area, you know. And so he, he starts barking at me. And I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. I'm, a, I'm practically a grown man running from a dog like a third of my size, quarter of my size. No way I should be running from this dog. So finally it just hit me. And I felt like the scriptures in my heart, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Like, do you want to run away from that dog for the rest of your life? Do you want to run away from that dog for the rest of your life? I'm running, I'm jogging, doing my thing, and that dog's, finally I just stopped. And that dog's still coming at me. And I thought, well, here we go, baby. David had his Goliath, and I got this little hairy thing right here. I'm about to find out. I'm about to find out. I thought I'm about to speak the word to this dog. If that don't work, my foot is about to go right through his face. I'm telling you right now, and I love animals, by the way. But I'm thinking this one of us is going to live through this. It's going to be me. That, that dog come running, come running, and I stopped, and I finally said, "You get up out of here now." You know what that dog did? Stopped in his tracks and ran back to the yard. I never felt so manly in my life. I never, I'm so serious. I never felt so much like a champion. You know what I mean? I felt like Rocky because I'd over, overcome, and I wasn't really afraid of dogs, but that would just grip me all the time. There's some areas of your life that are just like that. I said, there's some areas of your life that are just like that, that you've been letting it chase you all of your life. And you've just been running and running. For some of you, running from job to job. Some of you from town to town, city to city, relationship to relationship, even church to church. But it's time to stop and face that and say, I'm not going to run anymore. I'm going to live by faith and not by my fear. You can chase that dog right up out your house, right up out of your, your, your space. Praise God. Everybody, everybody say that was, that was good. Amen. Oladoxophobia, the fear of opinions. Mm. Arachibatyrophobia, that's horrible. Uh, afraid of the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. <laughs> that's bad. Uh, did ask a line of phobia, the fear of going to school. Come on, teenagers. Any teenagers know what I'm talking about? It's like, oh, yeah. Uh, I, right now. Right now. But you're off for a whole week, right? Some of y'all have this. Some of you are going to overcome it today. This is uh, lipophobia, the fear of fats in food. 
The fear of, how many of y'all know you can overcome that today? Yeah. One piece of cheesecake can do it. You can overcome that fear. <laughs> I'm overcoming my fears today, Pastor Aaron. I'm having 10 cookies today. <laughs> Paternophobia, this is the, eye, the fear of being tickled with feathers. I know, that's horrible. <laughs> And this is the last one I give you, Phobo, phobophobia, the, uh, the fear of having a phobia. Turn to Psalm 27. That's just, that's just maybe 10 or 20 that I mentioned of a list of 100 that are just mentioned. My point is this, though. The enemy... And life will try to surround you with fears to box you in to keep you from doing what God has called you to do. You don't have to be boxed in. Psalm 27, verses 1 and 2. Are you ready? Psalm 27, verses 1 and 2. It says it this way. The psalmist David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Message Bible says it this way. Light, space, zest, that's God. So with him on my side, I'm fearless, afraid of no one and nothing. With him on my side, I'm afraid of what? No one and nothing. Isn't that good? I'm afraid of no one and nothing. Well, I want you to notice something here. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. What is he saying here? He's saying my trust, my dependency is upon him. This is where we can really miss it sometimes. Where we're filled with fear, it's because our dependency is in the wrong place. A lot of times when the the rug is pulled out from underneath you, so to speak, you really find out where your trust really is. I mean, if you got a whole lot of money invested and you got a lot of money set aside for retirement, but then the stock market crashes and you lose 50,000, 100,000, couple hundred thousand, all of a sudden, everything you thought you were going to retire on is gone. Then you find out that what? Really, my trust was in my retirement fund, not in God who is to be my source. I mean, if you were to get the pink slip today or or next week and say, hey, you know what, Uh, um, you're not going to have a job in two weeks, you really find out where your trust really is because it may have been in that, that company or that position's ability to provide for you. I think some of the greatest opportunities of life present themselves as the greatest tragedies of life. The greatest difficulties of life that we face and we go, man, I, I, whew, Whew, man, I don't, want, I don't want to have to deal with this. I don't want, we really find out what we're made of. We really find out where our trust really is. We really find out where our, our dependency really is. Our little boy, his name is Jude. His name is Jude. He's seven years old. He's a great little fellow. We love him greatly. And, but when he was a little boy, when he was a baby, um, they, they, we took him to the uh, pediatrician, and they, he didn't have a soft spot on his head. When he was born, didn't have a soft spot on his head. He's just a, a hard head. Literally, I mean, at one point when he was a baby, he'd get mad and he, I'll never forget this, he would hit his head on the floor, boom, 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 like, what are you doing, bro? That's not the smartest thing you could ever do. I'll never forget being outside one time in the garage and he did it, he was mad, he's like one years old, he's mad he's in the garage about something and he hit his head on the concrete a few times, boom, boom, he stopped, he stopped after that. <laughs> But his head was always hard. I mean, if he threw his head back, you know, and we know when you're holding a baby or something, and they throw their head back, it's like, oh, you know, his head was like, he still has a pretty hard head. But they, they told us that because he didn't have a soft spot, they needed to check to make sure that there was enough space in his skull there. They, I don't know the technical terms, but so that his head could grow and his brain could grow and develop. And if he didn't, it's going to be a problem. He's going to have to have surgery and going to have to, uh, we're going to have to do the surgery where they cut out a piece of the skull from here, right? Am I saying this right? From here all the way back. And all the way across and probably going to have to do it a few times as he gets older. And so when you hear something like that, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do per se. Um, There's not a a whole lot even that the doctors can do except what they can do, helping the process. You find out in moments like that where your trust really is. We did take him to the doctor. We drove him to Shreveport, right? Wasn't it Shreveport or Monroe, something like that. We drove him up to the best and the best and do, do what we knew how to do. But we got in faith on that thing. 
I said, we got in faith on that thing. You know, if everything's going fine, it's great. But when you kind of hit a wall on something, that's when you really find out, boy, where is my trust really at? Because the best of the best doctors, I thank God for them. We got some magnificent spirit-filled doctors, even in our own church. But the, they'll tell you, I'm going to do the best that I can do. But the best I can do is the best that I can do. But there is a God who can do more than the best that any man can do. Well, if the economy goes like this again, I believe we're blessed and I believe our church is still going to flourish and believe God will make a way for you. But what a great opportunity to trust God and say, hey, my faith is in him. I've seen and I I can count different people in here that God opened up doors for you supernaturally, opened up doors for your provision supernaturally when it looked like you were against the wall and you thought, wow, there's no way God made a way. You found out that my trust is not to be in man, but my, and that's what David is saying. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I'm not going to fear what anyone can do for me. No one and no thing. Psalm 91, turn there. I want to look at a few more of these. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, and if you aren't here, I'll, I'll mention it to you as well. I want you to spend some extra time looking at Psalm 91, just the next few weeks especially. Every day, uh, read it. Say it out loud over yourself, over those that you love, those that you're concerned about, that you uh, are praying for. Psalm 91. And verse 1. It says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He who dwells, that's really what we looked at last week. If you were here last week, we talked about abiding, 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 abiding. That's what he's saying here. He who dwells, who abides, who abides in the secret place of the Most High, he says, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Amen. Then he says this, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. And this is what jumped out to me. You shall what? Come on, say it one more time. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. You shall what? Say it again. Not be, of the arrow that flies by day. You shall what? Of the pestilence that walks in darkness. You shall what? Of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. You shall not be afraid. Not be afraid. New Living Translation says, do not be afraid of the terrors of the night nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Basically, he's saying, look, things that you cannot see, that think about what that means, in the darkness, that things that you cannot see, things that are hidden. Anybody, when you were a kid, you were afraid of what was in the closet? Right, I I can remember being a kid, and I I remember telling my mom, uh, leave a crack in the door. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Leave a crack in the door. And then I remember saying this, come back and check on me. Isn't that horrible? I remember being a kid saying, uh, (laughs) as if I'm going to remember when she comes back and checks on me because I'm going to be asleep. But I'd say, leave a crack in the door and come back and check on me. Why? There's something about knowing that she was watching over me, that she was checking up on me, that there's a little light coming through that that would bring uh, help to me security to me. But right here he's saying, talking about things that are in the darkness, things that are in the night. You know what that refers to? It refers to the things that are unseen. You don't know what the future holds. I mean, we know the God who holds the future, but we don't per se know everything that he knows about the future. But if our trust is in him, then we can have faith in today because we know that he saw this day before we got here. So then my trust is in him in the darkness. That means when, when I cannot see, and he's talking about even the, the attacks of the enemy that may be being formed against you, that you don't know they're being formed against you. 
But then he talks about daytime. Even when there's things that we can see coming a mile off, we can see coming. Say, boy, that's going to be rough. Seems like that's going to be difficult. He says, listen, if you will dwell with me, if you will abide in me, if you'll stay close to me, I'm going to cover you under my wings. Hallelujah. Just like a mother hen just got the little chicks just keeping real close. I'm going to protect you. You're going to be all right if you'll stay close with me. That means I'm not afraid of what the future holds. I'm not afraid of what the night holds. I'm not afraid of what the enemy has planned for me. I know that no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. No attack of the enemy is going to work against me. The almighty God that I'm abiding in, dwelling in, living in, walking with. He's the one my trust is in. He's the one my trust is in. He's the one my trust is in. You know, even adults have night terrors. Night terrors. Sometimes not even sure exactly what it is. Just wake up. You have to recognize something that that's, that's not from God. And you're going to have to take a stand against it. On purpose. If you've never had something like that, you're like, yeah, okay, whatever. But if you've ever felt that or experienced that, it's simply an attack of the enemy to grip you in fear, not only for that night, but so that when you wake up, what are you doing? I'm just still thinking about that, that's, that gripped me. So all day long, instead of being filled with faith about what God has, you're scared, afraid, and that slips off into every area of our life. I found this to be true for, for many, many people, that the enemy will try to make some little thing in your life that's really not that big and try to blow it up into something really big and make it something that you fear. Yes. I remember hearing the story of uh, Brother Jesse Duplantis, a minister who comes here pretty regularly, and he was talking about how uh, one night, I'm not sure if he was in a hotel or at a, or at a guest home while he was ministering, but he was laying in bed and he saw across the room, he saw this look like a ghost-like shadow, you know, and he's, he said, it would just, it would start moving like that. And he said, I, I rebuked that devil. I said, demon, you get out of here. Rebuked that devil. He said, it would stop. He said, but a few minutes later, it started again. It started blowing. He said, man, whew. He said, all night long, I rebuked the devil all night long. I rebuked, get, you cannot stay in my room. Just did it, I mean, just name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God, you know, going at it, going at it, going at it. He said, when the sun finally arose in the morning, he realized it was just the coat hanging on the door. And every time the air conditioner would come on, it'd blow the coat just like that. Isn't that something? And many times that's exactly what the enemy is doing. Maybe he's forming something and maybe, yeah, he really is trying something. But the majority of the time, he's just got something he's trying to fill you with fear with so that you'll take hold of it and be in fear. Sometimes he just wants you to lose a night's sleep. I heard Brother Copeland uh, tell the story about how one time uh, in his life, he felt on the back of his neck, and he was this, this big thing on the back of his neck, and boy, is it, the devil told him that's a mole, and it's cancerous. You've got cancer on your neck. He's, boy, he felt that thing. He's like, boy, sure enough. Boy, sure enough. Looked in the mirror. Man, look at that. I got he said, I started rebuking that thing in the name of Jesus. I rebuke cancer. I am healed. I'm the healed of the Lord. I'm blessed of the Lord. By his stripes, I was healed. He sent his word, healed them, and delivered them from every destruction, every attack of the. Boy, I'm healed. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. He started blah, 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 going at it, going at it, going at it. So he told Glory to take a look at it. Gloria took a look at it, and he had been out in the woods, and it was a tick. <laughs> a tick on the back, isn't it? But it shows you how closely we can be, we can be just in, we can just jump right into fear just like that. That's, 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 I, I'm afraid of getting old. I'm, I'm afraid of staying young. I'm afraid of being married. I'm afraid of being single. I'm afraid of the person I'm married to. I'm afraid of my kids. I love them, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid of teenagers. I'm afraid of the future. I'm afraid I'm going to keep this job forever and never change. I'm afraid I'm going to lose this job forever and never change. I'm afraid I'm going to live in Alexandria for the rest of my life. I'm afraid I'm going to have to move out of Alexandria for the rest of my life. I'm afraid, right? Just constantly gripped by fear and instead 
instead of living like that, how about we wake up in the morning, get filled with his word, get filled with his presence, get filled with his spirit, and no matter the attack of the enemy on our life, we can say, hey, even if it was cancer, praise God, he is more than enough for me. Even if there was an attack of the enemy, praise God, I believe he's more than enough for me, but I'm not going to be gripped by fear in my life. I shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 46, verse 1 and 2 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And look at the extreme that he puts it to here. Even though the earth be removed. (laughs) What? Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Even though what? The earth be removed. Even though the earth be removed, I'm not going to be in fear. Things change. I'm not going to be in fear. Very present help in time of trouble. You'll notice in just about all of these, where is the source of his strength? Who is with him? Who is with him? God's with him. As long as I got you by my side. Think about Psalmist David, King David. All that was available to him, money, power, everything he could ever ask, want for in that time, he could have had. But yet he said, my my strength, what keeps me going, what allows me to live in faith is the one I'm walking with, the one who's by my side. One place even says, even when my mother and father forsake me. Yeah. Yeah. That means even when those that I love the most, that are the closest to me, if they ever leave, and he's talking about his mom and dad really, if they die, so I'm still going to be all right. I know who I'm walking with. I said, I know who I'm walking with. Can you turn to Psalm 23 real quick? Everybody say, I will not not fear. fear. One more time. Say, I will not not fear. fear. I got to be honest with you. I don't even watch like fear-filled movies. I mean, you may enjoy, uh, you know, uh, all of that kind of stuff. I've I've just never seen it produce a whole lot of good. I'm serious. You can think that's my opinion or whatever. I'm just, I just don't like feeding my fears, that's all. Amen. I, I don't prefer to see Saw. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and can't figure out why I can't have a good night's rest. It's like I watched a saw marathon. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die by way of a saw. I ain't, I ain't going there. I mean, you can go there all you want, but don't, don't ask me to pray for you to be in faith if you're just going to feed, feed you, your fear like that. Yeah, we don't even watch the commercials. Fast forward them. I mean, it's amazing. You try to watch a football game and some crazy thing come on. All my kids go. Now, kids remember that sort of thing. If you're going to watch it, at least keep your kids from it. Say, well, they're used to it by now. Is that a good thing? I said, is that a good thing? Boy, we got straight on some other stuff, didn't we? Praise Jesus. <laughs> My little boy, we watched, what was it? It was one of the kids' movies, like, um, oh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid or something like that. And, and there's this one little story, just a goofy little story, where this hand comes into the tent or something like that. Am I right? Something like this little hand comes in the tent. And we're, it's nothing. Goofy. We're laughing. I don't know if y'all know what I'm talking about. We're like laughing, all that stuff. And Jude, Jude, we go to put him in bed at night. 
I put them in bed and I pray for them. Aaron Cody, pray, plead the blood of Jesus over them, sweet rest, do the will of God for your life, all the good stuff, pray for them, all the good things, say all this good stuff over them, and then close the door. He says, Dad, <laughs> like, what's this? <laughs> Come here. <laughs> okay, open the door. I'm like, what's up? He goes, I'm afraid. I go, oh, what you afraid of? He goes, the hand. <laughs> the hand. The hand's going to get me. I, I started laughing. I'm like, the hand. The hand? Oh, bro. Don't be afraid of the hand. I mean, we had to work through it for like 30 minutes. Close the door. Dad, I still see the hand. I'm like, oh, Jesus. You about to get the hand on your behind, man. You go to bed now. Psalm 23, don't tell him I said all that. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Boy, that should just take the fear of lack right out of you right there. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He says, I will fear what? No evil. Why? For you are with me. I will fear no evil, for you're with me. You're with me. Amen. Just this past week, um, we were at the church, and I was right behind here, and Sean Blaylock and uh, him and his wife, Abby, part of our church family, they were in the first service um, they just have a brand new baby boy. His name's Ethan. And a cute little fella. He's only a few months old now, maybe four or five months old. And um, Abby was here at the church, and she was working, and Sean was stopping by to do a little bit of work. And, and, um, and uh, I didn't know he had the baby with him, but he got the baby out. He got the baby in his arm like that. I said, well, look at there, man. He said, oh, yeah. He says, this, this baby's not afraid of heights. Oh, think about it. Think about how high you hold a baby. Right, this baby's not a, afraid of heights. And I thought, well, yeah, not until you drop him is what I'm thinking. Yeah, you drop him one time, got nothing to be afraid of. But I thought about that. I thought, he's not afraid of heights. Why, why is he not afraid of heights? Because of who's holding him. Daddy's holding me. Daddy's protecting me. As long as daddy's holding me, I, and, and even dads can miss it from, t- from time to time. I won't get into that. But, uh, but because of dad's, got me in his arm, I'm going to be all right. If you stop and think about what the psalmist David is saying, he says, oh, I I will not fear because of who is with me. The one who is holding me, the one who is protecting me. He's the almighty God. He's my father God, and I'm safe in his arms. Safe in his arms. I've had a few times in my life where it just felt like, whew, this is not good spot I'm in. And every time when it seemed like there was nothing to hold on to, even though I've been blessed with so many wonderful people in my life, my family, my wife, my kids, in everyone's life, there are times where you have to know who you're really holding on to. Amen. Amen. Who am I holding on to? Because if I'm holding on to him, or even better, he's holding on to me. I may feel like I'm dangling, but I know who's holding me. I don't have to be afraid of the arrow. I don't have to be afraid of the disease, pestilence. I don't have to be afraid of the hand. I don't have to be afraid of the bathtub. I don't have to be afraid of getting older. I don't have to be afraid of cancer. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid of the coat that's swinging on a door. I don't have to be afraid of the tick that's on the back of my neck. I don't have to live in fear. I'm not going to live in fear. But if the enemy can keep you in a place of fear, he knows you'll never fulfill the plan that God has for you. Yeah, maybe you'll make heaven one day because you took a step of faith to receive Jesus but you'll never fulfill what God has designed for your life. I don't know about you, but I want to fulfill what God has for my life. I want to do what he's called me to do. How are we going to do that? By faith. 
taking steps of faith and not in fear. Not in fear. Praise God. Everybody say, I will not fear. One more time, say, I will not fear. First John 4, 18, I want to share just a couple more things with you. Then I'll let you go back out into the rain. Or the sunshine. I'll let you go overcome your fear of eating. First John 4, in verse 18, says it this way. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. It says perfect love what? Casts out fear. Casts out fear. Uh, a few months ago, we were cleaning out some stuff at our house and I went up in the attic and we were looking for some things to uh, give away or to sell in a garage sale or something. So we go up in the attic and I go up there and Aaron Cody says, is there anything up there? I said, well, there's a, we got a few, uh, we got a few um, uh, suitcases up here. I said, well, how many? And I started counting them. I'm like, well, we got like 15 suitcases up here. <laughs> I'm not sure how we got this many suitcases. I don't know if we bought a new one then put the old one up and then bought another new one then put the old one up over a number of years. I don't know, but she said, well, start throwing them down here. So I started throwing them down, suitcase after suitcase after suitcase. She said, is there anything else up there? And this is, now our kids are older now. She said, well, we got a few strollers up here. Well, how many strollers we got up there? I don't know. Let's start counting, start throwing them down. We must have had three, four, five just umbrella strollers. How many know when you have kids and you travel, you're like, yeah, well, let's, uh, we need a stroller. Hurry up. Let's buy another umbrella stroller. Praise God. So everywhere we go, we get a stroller. Then, then at one point, both of our kids, that our oldest, were only a year apart. So we had a, a double stroller. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The double stroller. Double wide. <laughs> Big daddy. I mean, we had a stroller that when you go to the airport, it's like torture. And when you go to open that thing in a parking lot somewhere, it's like work, man. You're sweating before you even make it into the mall, right? I mean, that sort of thing. We had all kind of stuff. We just getting all this junk down from out of our attic, out of our attic. And what are we doing with it? We're just getting it out of the house, throwing it out, throwing it out. I, I've, got a, I've got a hunch that there's some of you who are great believers, wonderful Christians, and serving the Lord very well, probably for many years, but you've still got some fears in the attic. You've got some stuff that you still, maybe not everybody can see it all the time, Maybe not even those close to you can see it all the time, but it motivates the way you live. My prayer today is that today you say, you know what? I'm not going to live by fear ever again. I'm going to get the junk out of the attic and that perfect love that comes from the Father God. I'm going to let that surround my heart, surround my life. I'm not going to be afraid of the attacks of the enemy. I'm not gonna be afraid of lack. I'm not gonna be afraid of sickness. I'm not gonna be afraid of disease. I'm not gonna be afraid of, of relationships. I'm not gonna be afraid of closeness. I'm not gonna be afraid of marriage, the, uh, the lack of one or the one I'm in. I'm not gonna live, I'm not gonna live in fear anymore. Amen. I'm gonna stay in faith. Hallelujah. And just cast it out like you don't want it there no more. God's called you to live with great expectation of the future. How can you live in great expectation of what God has for your future if you're always afraid? I don't have to live afraid. I don't have to live afraid. Can we look at one more Romans chapter 13? Chapter 15, excuse me, verse 13. Romans chapter 15 and verse 13 is in him. When the job gets taken away, what does you trust? When you hit a bump in the road in your marriage, what does you trust? When your kids hit a tough spot, what does you trust? When there's no turkey on the table, <laughs> Thanksgiving Day, what does you trust? David was pretty radical when he said, though the earth be removed. You know what that means? He had radical trust. 
Radical trust. Radical dependency. Radical dependency. My prayer is that when we leave here today, that our hope and our expectation is upon the one who's worthy of our expectation. No phobias here. It's a phobia-free zone. I'm not going to live in fear. I'm going to live by faith. He wants to keep you in a place where you never even try to do what God has called you to do because you're afraid of failing at doing it. My dad taught us how to swim a very interesting way. He threw us in the pool. I mean, he gave us a few instructions before, but then we're going to find out what you got. Yeah. I learned how to swim that day. Maybe it's not the best way for everybody to teach their kids how to. We didn't do that with our kids, but I'm sure my mom was in the pool trying to rescue me. Trying to say, swim, swim here, tell me what to do. But I'll tell you what, though the earth be removed, my trust is in him. And for some of you, you're hitting a few walls right now that you're finding out whether you can swim or not. You're finding out what living by faith is really all about. I can remember the first few times in my life where I had been just enjoying the faith and the steps that my parents had taken and enjoyed their covering and their blessing and their provision. But the first steps that we had taken where it's like, ooh, we're going to see God come through. When Jude had that going on in his head. When you go through real shadows of death, so to speak, my trust is in him. My hope is in him. When the job gets taken away, where's your trust? When you hit a bump in the road in your marriage, where's your trust? When your kids hit a tough spot, where's your trust? When there's no turkey on the table, Thanksgiving Day, where's your trust? David was pretty radical when he said, though the earth be removed. You know what that means? He had radical trust. Radical trust. Radical dependency. Radical dependency. My prayer is that when we leave here today, that our hope and our expectation is upon the one who's worthy of our expectation. No phobias here. It's a phobia-free zone. Thank you. I'm not going to live in fear.